This is chapter 13, part 2. We're going to be continuing our look at the history of how we came to know DNA as the molecule of heredity. And that was discovered through the works that we've already heard about uh, by Griffith and Avery, um, Hershey and Chase. And so now that we know that DNA is the molecule of heredity, other groups were looking at, well, what is DNA? And is this a universal thing among all organisms, or is this just something that's unique to the ones that they were looking at in those experiments, bacteria and viruses? Um, so the work of uh, Erwin Shargraf, a biochemist, shows how DNA is really the molecule of heredity of all life. He found an interesting relationship between the proportion of the different nitrogenous bases in DNA, which if you recall, those are adenine, or A, thymine, abbreviated T, guanine, G, and cytosyl, cytosine, sorry, C. Um, and how it's shown here is that in each of these species that were examined in his research, he found a very, very similar proportion of two of those nitrogenous bases. Adenine and thymine always had about the same percentage in each of those organisms he studied. And similarly, guanine and cytosine. From Homo sapiens, which are humans, to uh, E. coli, the bacteria that's living in our guts. It, it, those very diverse organisms had that same percentage relationship between those um, nitrogenous bases. Now these rule, th this um, finding led to what we now know as Shargaff's rules, which also helped explain the structure of DNA physically as a double helix, and we'll come to see how that comes in in a few minutes. So based on Shargaff's rules, the percent of adenine is equal to the percent of thymine, and the percent of guanine is equal to the percent of cytosine. Now, as shown here, adenine and guanine are a type of nitrogenous base that are called purines, and they're different in their structure from the pyrimidines, which are thymine and cytosine, because the purines are made of two fused rings, carbon rings, and the pyrimidines are only one hexagonal carbon ring. And this, this also gives us more insight about the structure of DNA, because if there were different rules for the base pairs, then the double helix might not be uh, symmetrical or in a, a regular shape. But we're not quite there yet um, because this biochemical evidence supports the work that somebody else did where they actually were able to photograph DNA. Not a traditional photograph, <laughs> but an X-ray photograph. Rosalind Franklin, at the time, very rare for a female to be involved in science, so she's really a, a famous woman in science. Um, she took a picture using X-ray crystallography to determine the, the DNA is a double helical structure. This is a top-down view of DNA. So what you see through the middle, that X pattern, those are like the rungs of the ladder. Those are the nitrogenous bases, the A, the T, the G, the C. And then the, the ring around the outside would be the backbone, the sugar phosphate backbone that we now know, of course. Her picture, along with Shargaff's discovery, Shargaff's rules, if you will, were then used by probably the most famous scientists known for their discovery of the DNA structure and also some processes related to DNA. I'm sure you've heard of Watson and Crick. And they were, in fact, awarded the Nobel Prize for their research using some other folks' data, of course, um, and unfortunately not really giving them credit where credit was due. In fact, if I could speak a little bit more about Rosalind before these guys, she unfortunately died before she was even recognized for her work. Her photograph was used without her permission, without her knowledge. Um, she had passed away, of course. Uh, that might have been part of it. Um, and sadly, her, the cause of her death was um, ovarian cancer, likely due to the x-ray exposure from her research. Yeah, terrible, right? But even after she had died, no mention of her contribution, her photograph was made by 
those who um, got all the credit basically for the work. It wasn't until many years later that her contribution was discovered, and now she's you know world famous, of course, for her her sacrifice, you know, basically giving her life for that really amazing picture that led to so much knowledge and the ability of these guys Watson and Crick to come up with the model for the DNA double helix coupled with the biochemical information from Shargaff with the knowledge of with the picture showing that symmetrical double helix from that um, x-ray crystallography along with the biochemical information from Shargaff it was it was concluded then that the way that the bases would pair up together could only be that you had a purine with a pyrimidine because if two purines matched up together if those paired together the 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 double helix would be too wide in certain places there'd be like bulges and then vice versa if two pyrimidines coupled together then there'd be areas where it would be narrow it would sort of like meander wide and narrow and wide and narrow but because it's a consistent width it was determined that there would have to be a purine with a pyrimidine and that coupled with Shargaff's data led to the knowledge that well it can't just be any purine with any pyrimidine that adenine will bond with thymine and guanine with cytosine so here we have Shargaff's rules with the actual chemical structures of these um, nitrogenous bases. Now, the way they pair together, notice here these little red dots, those are representing hydrogen bonds. And if you recall from our other discussions about hydrogen bonds, they are a weak bond and they can easily be broken and reformed. And that is a very important. Um, a very important thing about DNA because it has the ability to separate these bonds in the formation of new DNA molecules. It's part of DNA replication that we're going to learn about in a later lesson. But it's not just about the A, the T, the G, and the C. Remember, this is just one part of the building block of a nucleic acid. If you recall from chapter three, when we talked about polymers and the different types of organic molecules, DNA is a nucleic acid. And nucleic acids are made of the monomer called nucleotides. Each nucleotide has three components. The sugar, which for DNA is called deoxyribose, and that's the five carbon sugar here. It's, it's a pento sugar, has one, two, three, four in the ring, and then one carbon that hangs outside of the ring because oxygen is kind of like at the head of that carbon, um, five carbon sugar. And the sugar is attached, it's like the middle component of the nucleotide. It has a link to the nitrogenous base and also to the phosphate group that links each um, nucleotide to the next one. That's what holds the backbone together. I want to spend a little bit more time examining this because when we get to talk about DNA replication, um, we need to be able to differentiate between what's called the five prime end and the three prime end of each DNA strand. So as you can see here, and we're just looking at one strand, the other complementary strand is not shown. At the top left, it says this is the five prime end. And at the bottom left, it says this is the three prime end. How do you know which is the five and the three prime end? Well, the the number system, one, two, three, four, five prime, has to do with the position of the carbon in the deoxyribose sugar. So it, as you can see at the top and the bottom, there's these little pink or red numbers with a little apostrophe. That's that's you would say this one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, five prime. So the the nitrogenous base is always attached to the first prime carbon of deoxyribose. And the phosphate group is always attached to the five prime carbon of the deoxyribose. So how do you know the difference between the five prime and the three prime end? The five prime end is always going to have that phosphate group that's not bonded with another nucleotide. It's just hanging off just this exposed phosphate. Whereas the three prime end, 
the phosphate group is bonded already. It's locked up in between adjacent um, nucleotides bonded to two sugars. And so the three prime end, the, um, the functional group there is a hydroxyl OH. And this is, this is important to note because if you recall, when we did dehydration synthesis reactions, there were hydroxyl groups involved that led to the water molecule that comes off during dehydration synthesis. In fact, it's on the three prime end that the next nucleotide can be added via dehydration synthesis. And that mechanism is shown here. So notice how on the hydroxyl group is where the next um, nucleotide is going to be added, a phosphate from the next nucleotide, and the other three are going to, um, sorry, it's a, it's a triphosphate here, but only one is actually going to remain. Um, the other two will leave and probably be used for recycling, because remember, like AD, ATP, ADP, those inorganic phosphoruses can be used again, recycled in a way, uh, as shown here at the bottom, plus two phosphates linked together. Um, so, and this particular bond that forms in between those adjacent nucleotides is called a phosphodiester bond. Um, unlike the bonds in the proteins that link together the, mono, the monomers, which were the amino acids, those were called peptide bonds. And in carbohydrates, the covalent bonds that link together the monosaccharides are glycosidic bonds. So it is, a, it is a type of a covalent bond, but it's specifically called a phosphodiester bond. So we're going to stop here, but I just want to emphasize the importance of understanding the three and the five prime end and how the three prime end is involved in um, the addition of new nucleotides, because this concept is going to come up not just in replication, but also in future lessons regarding DNA.